Matthew Kranig is an associate professor at Georgetown University and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He joins me now from Washington. Matthew, all this threatening fire and fury talk from the president doesn't seem to be wearing down Kim Jong-un's nuclear ambitions. Do you think the North Koreans will come back to the negotiating table? Is that possible or are we going to war? Well, I, I don't think we're going to war. Uh, you know, I think the president's threats and the threats from others in the administration weren't uh, promising a U.S. attack. Rather, they were saying that the United States and our allies will be prepared uh, in case North Korea attacks. So it's kind of a classic deterrent threat. Make it clear to North Korea that the consequences of any North Korean attack would be uh, unacceptable for them to stop them from doing it. Um, I think there is a chance that we could return to the negotiating table. Uh, it won't be easy, but this is the main pillar of the Trump administration's strategy to increase pressure on North Korea to bring them to the table and try to get a deal to limit this nuclear and missile program. North Korea says that these missiles would land less than 25 miles from the U.S. air base in Guam. When the North Koreans promise something like this, is it bravado or do you think that they will try and launch this? If you look at the history of North Korean behavior, they often make these outlandish threats. Uh, they make a threat, uh, it seems like, once a month to turn Asia into a sea of fire. So far, they haven't done that. So I think uh, this is just bravado. It's an empty threat. Uh, that said, the United States should take it seriously. Uh, so we do have missile defenses uh, that we could use to shoot down uh, these missiles. Um, and, um, you know, we have other means to try to protect ourselves and to retaliate. Um, if deterrence fails. Do you consider this an, a failure of U.S. intelligence? Did we underestimate the North Korean regime? I think we did underestimate them. You know, you look back just um, a couple of months ago, and the estimates were that it would take North Korea a few years to develop an ICBM capable of reaching the United States. Uh, according to a Washington Post report earlier this week, they have that capability already today. Uh, so exceeded that estimate by, by many years. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it does show the limits of, of U.S. intelligence. For the most part, it's very good, but um, we can even miss big threats like this. When you talk about missing big threats, have there been similar shortcomings in the intel community when you're facing similar threats like this under the Obama or Bush administration? Well, going back even further, we really uh, underestimated how quickly it would take the Soviet Union to develop nuclear weapons in the 1940s. You know, at the time, uh, the CIA was estimating it would take the Soviet Union a decade to build nuclear weapons, and they succeeded uh, quickly. So the tendency has been for the U.S. intelligence community to be too cautious. Um, actually, our adversaries are usually ahead of things. Um, you know, Iraq WMD is the one area where really U.S. intelligence was wrong in the other direction. We thought Iraq was much further along uh, in its WMD programs than it, than it actually was. We know our intelligence in North Korea is not the best. And as you mentioned, the Soviets, it was also hard getting intelligence during that era from the Soviets. So how do you bridge that divide when you're dealing with an area like North Korea when you don't have a wealth of intelligence there? Well, some of the best sources of intelligence are human intelligence, you know, having uh, spies on the ground. Uh, so when you have formal diplomatic relations with a country, that's much easier because you can station diplomats, uh, station U.S. officials uh, in the capital who can gather information. Uh, with North Korea, we don't have people on the ground. We don't have formal diplomatic uh, ties. So therefore, we're forced to rely on other more high-tech means of trying to glean information. Um, but as we've seen this time, uh, sometimes those uh, sources of information aren't as accurate as having the human sources on the ground. Yeah, it's so important for that type of intel, especially Matthew Craning. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.